Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the FTD virtual design show titled Weddings with Style Rescheduled, featuring FTD education consultant Ian Prosser, AIFD. This design show series is a way to keep us all connected, be inspired, and share knowledge and solutions to solve problems. We are excited to welcome Ian live today to share current wedding design trends from his design studio in Tampa, Florida. As a leading wedding and event designer, Ian will share essential business tips showing how florists can tackle the new normal of postponed weddings and how to manage the costs involved. Once Ian is finished with his presentation, we will open up the session for questions. If you have a question, simply type it in the chat box in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to submit your questions during the presentation. This session will be recorded. So let's get started, everyone. Welcome, Ian. Well, thank you, Janet. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. And this is a little bit of a, an unusual situation for all of us, but I understand lots of people are enjoying these uh, virtual education sessions. And FTD has been uh, good enough to put a number of them together for us. And of course, you all saw Deborah um, a few weeks ago, and Jacob is coming up in another few weeks. So I hope you find some benefit here. It's, you know, it's a shorter, uh, space of time than we normally have to, to share some ideas and some uh, insight into what's going on in this crazy floral world of ours. Um, retail florists don't seem to be as affected. I know that you are, but you still have uh, the steady income of day-to-day of -day orders. I have some friends that are finding that they are busier than they normally are at this time of year with day-to-day uh, -day orders because people essentially are not going out to buy a gift and flowers as we all know is a, is a fantastic choice. Um, I used to have a retail store or retail stores uh, and now we have purely an event company and uh, yes we have seen some tremendous uh, drops in business you know it's uh, to give you the number would be would horrify you so I'll keep it to myself um, because it horrifies me but we're starting to see a little upswing of business getting uh, placed within a very short space of time you know we're getting a week or two weeks notice and they're what we call pop-up weddings or pop-up events of course um, Corporate events are not back in the swing yet, but, but uh, regular weddings are now beginning to, we're seeing people really beginning to book. The difference is instead of it being 150 people or 200, it's for 30 people or 40 people or 50 people. So how, how, do, we, how do we handle it? You know, the, the wedding uh, event or the event industry in general, 77% of people employed within the event industry have lost 100% of their income. So for the event industry, it really is, it's tragic. And we need to get something going here to make sure that, that we don't completely lose so many fabulous vendors, fabulous florists. You know, unfortunately we're hearing of, of some people falling by the wayside. You know, we can only hang on for, for so long and it's been seven months already. So. What did we do? The, you know, that, that's a question that we get asked so many times. So back in the spring, we had weddings that of course moved to the fall. And what they started to do was to take some of our premium dates in the fall. But at the same time, we had very many situations where we were already booked. But now we have your wedding that we were supposed to do in April and you would like to move it till October. So how did we handle it? So people that, um, that we wanted to take care of, which of course was everyone in this situation, we offered them between a Sunday and a Friday. If they booked Sunday through Friday, then there was no extra cost. We did charge 15% labor cost if the wedding had to be on a Saturday. Now, why did we do that? The reason that we did that was not to make more money, but we needed more people. So we already, if we already had a weekend that was heavily booked, which we had, and now we have two more weddings that weekend, in order to take care of that wedding, we needed to bring in 
more people to produce it and more people to set it up. When we explained this to individuals, it didn't seem to be a problem at all. And so that's the way that we kind of got through the weather, the storm. So what we also did was we asked people, now let me see how I can explain this to make it easy. So if their wedding was, let's say June, and they were due to pay their balance at the end of May. If they were moving their wedding, we asked them to pay 50% of the remaining balance that they owed us at the time that they should normally be paying it for the June wedding, and then 50% in October when, when it became wedding time. That way, what it did was it gave us some monies to continue to do business. Uh, you know, we have 12 of a staff here and we continued to pay our staff and have continued to pay our staff. Um, you know, we, we did get PPP, which is only eight weeks long, but this way um, it did help us. And we have, um, I, I think our staff do have a, a better appreciation for us than they had before because we, we have chosen to pay them. Unfortunately, we had money in the bank that, that we could do that, you know, but as time goes on, um, it's like taking a snowplow to your checking account and the money just disappears and is not getting replenished. It doesn't seem, but now we're really starting to see an influx of smaller events that, you know, that we're getting excited about. We have an $8,000 wedding this weekend. Yay. Um, Whereas that would, you know, we're very grateful for that, of course, but that would have been a smaller end size wedding for us during normal times. We did have one weekend in May that we had $100,000 of weddings booked and it ended up being a $2,700 weekend. So that's a big hit. That is a big hit. And, you know, we, we just, we've just plotted on. I have every faith that we will come out the other side, every faith in the world. Um, you know, we're hard workers. Uh, as flawed as we are, hard workers. And, you know, we've gone through hard times um, for different reasons in this part of the country. Um, you know, I, I opened my store and uh, bought a new store, bought a building, and 10 days later was 9-11. It took me three years to sell the merchandise that I had bought. You know, and so we've had... I've had some practice at this. So I knew that we needed to um, kind of put money away for a rainy day. Well, guess what? It was not only a rainy day, but it's a hurricane. So here we are. But uh, I, I'm glad that we did that. And I'm glad that we we're able to pay our people. And I'm, I'm delighted that we're starting to see events, uh, events come back. Um, it's a tough time. I, I, and, you know, we have to resort to some measures that we perhaps don't want to. The one piece of advice that I really want to share with you is do not, do not drop your prices. So many people that I know are trying to give deals because they are desperate for business. You can't do that. You have got to, you have worked for so many years to bring the level of what you do to a certain price range. And you've got to dig in your heels and, you know, say, well, you know, these are our prices. We have found people respect that. But at the same time, we have to have individuals um, a, a, as an event industry or as florists, you know, we have to all be on the same track. We have to all, you know, do the same thing, not drop our prices and do not give your deposits back. That deposit should have read in any circumstances, non-refundable. And if you do not have the words non-refundable on your contract, you will have by tomorrow. Because if you don't have that, then you're due to give people your money back. But I think, I think that we need, to, we need to all be on board you know, the baker, the photographer, everyone, the, the venue, and don't give your deposits back because then 
people have something that they can say, well, you know, the florist gave me the money back or the baker gave me the money back or whatever. And then it puts you in a really bad position. We've only had two situations that got slightly sticky. Um, and if we'd had the wedding planners read the contracts properly, then they would have realized that, you know, 21 days out to cancel your wedding here in Tampa and move it somewhere else, you're actually liable by the documentation that you have signed to pay us in full. Now, we did not hold them to that, but uh, we've, we've had two situations that were not the best. So please make sure that on your contract, any monies that you take as a deposit, you should word it as a retainer because it, they are retaining your services, which means you can then charge them, should they cancel the wedding, you can then charge them for the time that you have invested in them to, to meet with them, to do contracts, to you know, do samples or, or whatever it may be. But this way it safeguards you. So please use the word retainer. And anytime you use that, it is non-refundable. If you ask for a second draw of money, it is a non-refundable additional retainer. So, you know, we have to look out for ourselves these days and, and make sure that we have all our, you know, T's crossed and, and I's dotted. So uh, we also have had to have um, a lawyer look into our contract and the contract then now has to have a pandemic, an international pandemic clause. And so that took a lot of money and a lot of time um, to get all of that worked out. But it, it's so funny, it's sign of, signs of the times. We just need to make those changes and you need to cover yourself as, as you do it. So anyway, I'm gonna go off of my uh, orange box for the moment, Preacher Prosser is over, but I just want to share with you things that, that how we handled it so that perhaps it gives you a little bit of insight and a little bit of advice as to how you can handle that situation um, as it arises. Because of course, we now have had weddings that, that were spring weddings that moved to the fall that have now moved to next year. So the amount of work changing from a, you know, a spring wedding and you've met with them and you've shown them the samples and we've shown them tablecloths and blah, blah. Now they change to the fall. So it was a completely new meeting. It was new samples. And now they've changed from the fall back to the spring, but they don't want what they wanted initially. So essentially we've had three lots of meetings with the same client. And I really feel that we can't charge for that. Otherwise it looks like we are really uh, grabbing at the dollar. So, so um, you know, let your conscience be your guide, but you'll also have to make sure that you are gonna be here in April to do the wedding that has moved twice. So anyway, one of the um, requests that we had was um, how to make a cascade bouquet because the cascade style of bouquet is coming back and it's very hard to do as a hand tied. So many of you, I'm sure, that are younger were not taught how to um, wire and tape and make a cascade that way. I've been, oh my goodness, 40 something years in this business now. And so that when we started out, everything was done by hand wire and taped, but there was always a golden rule. And that golden rule still applies today, whether it be a hand tied cascade or whether it be a, a cascade in a holder. And the golden rule is that from the center point of the bouquet, two thirds of the bouquet goes forward one third of the bouquet comes back and that gives us perfect, perfect balance for someone holding it. Then it's held properly and it's presented the way that you have designed it to be. So nowadays we're, you know, we're into bouquet holders and this works really well. But if I turn it side on just for the moment, this is how typically you would use the bouquet holder. And I have always hated it because when a bride holds her bouquet, it tends to tip forward with the weight. So in all the photographs, this is what we see. We see the back of the bouquet. So if you take that bouquet holder and you turn it, 
so that the handle is upwards and the foam is to the front, then it becomes much more comfortable to hold and the hands then hide the holder. And then you can do your, so this would be the center point of your, your holder here rather than here. So it's when you're holding it, this is your central axis, two thirds of the bouquet forward, one third of the bouquet backwards, and it will give you perfect balance. So let's just look at, at the beginnings of this. So here we are. So here's the cascade. What I tend to do is give it a quick outline of foliage, and that way I know the sizes that, uh, the width and the length that I'm dealing with. So this is a fairly decent length bouquet, um, probably two feet in, in length. Um, so what I did was in the holder and use all of these holes in the back are supposed to be used. So put your flowers back into here and look at how, see here's the, here's the center, there's two thirds to the front, one third to the back, and it gives us this very gentle arc. So this is, um, this is how you would start out the front flowers here. I normally do a double leg wire, run the wire all the way through the holder and hook it onto the holder so that these, these flowers at the front that are getting the most abuse are not going to go anywhere. So let, that's step number one. Step number two is then to run your focal flowers into it. So now I've got my orchids that you saw initially. We still have the orchids in, and now I've placed the roses, which is my main focal line here, and then I can fill in with the other things. So we've got uh, Tibet roses here and the um, dendro white dendrobium orchids that are giving the cascade. I use a lot of foliage from the garden. So when I plant my garden, I, I plant things I can cut. And we also have a little piece of property between the two buildings here that we uh, plant some things like jasmine and we have palms, of course. And these are, we have three or four different kinds of jasmine back there that um, really help with the look that is current. So that's step number two. And then here we have the completed item. So the, here's the bouquet. We've now, I've now added Veronica, spray roses, ranunculus, a little touch of lysianthus. And so it's very easy if you, and look at how it, it holds. You can't see my hands, they're right underneath it. And you can see my, you know, golden rule. Here's the center, one third back, two thirds forward, and make a very gentle arc. And that way it photographs beautifully when the bride is holding it and it also covers her hands. So hopefully that helps um, some of you with, with the, the creating of cascades. I mean, so many designers nowadays came into the business when good old Martha Stewart started out and uh, Preston Bailey and everything was a tight wad and it was a hand tied and it was two dozen roses and you could throw that sucker together in a heartbeat. But um, now, nowadays, they're leaning back to the, the cascading bouquets or these way oversized bouquets that are, would just weigh a ton. So um, I would think that probably the egg or the pillow is a good way to give you an armature if you're just, just starting out because um, if, you, if you do the foliage first, you can always add more, but if you create a, a, an initial size of the bouquet with the foliage and then place your flowers through it, then it's a whole lot easier. So what else are we seeing around? Um, pink is still with us big time. You know, I thought for a long time that, that we were gonna end up, you know, seeing that blush pink go goodbye, but it's not. It's here and it seems like it's here to stay And just as it was going out the door, then Pantone made blush pink color of the year. So it's still here. Um, the look is slightly different from what we dealt with before, and, and it's a, a fad that is here for a little while, I think. Um, a, a trend normally lasts four years, and we see changes in that trend and, and a colorway within four years. You know, if you remember a few years ago, we, we saw like what I called the Starbucks suite. We went from um, Cafe Ole to Mocha to coffee, to espresso. So it was the Starbucks suite. 
Um, but every color tends to do that. It either gets lighter or darker and it lasts normally for around four years. So design styles will do the same thing. Here's the deal. For people that have only ever done flowers uh, as a hobby and this untidy, messy, leafy look uh, was, has been around for probably two years now. Um, when that goes away, what do they do? So if you have no formal training or if you don't invest enough in yourself to go to an FTD sponsored class or show, um, then do something. Let's go to a wholesale show or in, you have to invest in yourself because this trend will eventually go away and then what do you do if this is all that you know? So anyway, do, please don't set yourself up for that situation. I have some beautiful flowers here from the, from the Milano company that are just, just gorgeous. Uh, Darcy roses here, which are beautiful. Pink Veronica added a little bit of uh, a pink wax flower just to give me a slight untidiness. Uh, I've anchored the size of this design with some hydrangea. Some are tucked really deeply. Just a couple are really visible. There's maybe three here, but I have another three tucked in. We've got this pinky lavender stock, Pink Floyd, which is one of my favorite roses because look at this baby here, it's, it's huge. It's, she never lets you down and it smells delightful also. So um, I've used a lot of garden foliages. This is jasmine here. I've got a little bit of um, feather eucalyptus. Uh, this is viburnum for my garden. This is um, weeping elm from one of the trees in my yard that holds up really beautifully and gives you these really soft curves. We've got some millet. Um, and then I, I added just a little touch of pampas grass because we're seeing a lot of pampas grass still being used. Some things I like to group because it makes you pay more attention to it. Um, had we used the millet and just what I call salt and peppered it all through the entire design, it wouldn't be nearly as effective as it is here. So you can see that I've, I've inserted it here in groups and we get this beautiful foliage with it, but this sharp green of the, of the millet is, is really quite beautiful. But using um, different garden foliages, as I said, you know, is a, is a big plus. So here we've got the look right now is we have a lot very deeply recessed and the rest is coming forward. So you're getting great dimension and it doesn't look like a flat altarpiece. I mean, this could be used as an altarpiece. It could be used in the entryway of, of a hotel or country club or whatever it may be, or it could be used on pedestals either side of a mantle as we think of these micro weddings. Um, micro weddings is what they're calling them nowadays. And we are seeing a lot of these being held in people's homes. The thing that always puzzles me is that, you know, if you have a wedding that was already signed up and they were gonna do $2,000 of flowers or $3,000 or $4,000 or $5,000 for the ceremony, and now you're getting married and this is gonna be the only wedding you have, you might have a party later, but you're all, you're going to really downsize and have two altar pieces whereas you were going to have a big structure or whatever. So I think we need to listen to them and we need to put forth the idea of, you know, if you don't think that you will have another ceremony, then I think it would be important from a photographic standpoint to do something that looks important and impressive because remember these photographs, you know, are what you're going to have for a lifetime that you'll share with your children and your grandchildren and such like, and will be in a video if, if it's videotaped. So I think we have to think of quietly and gently. I, I'm, almost, I'm always a very soft seller and I like to sow the seed and step away. Don't, don't you know, pump them hard like a, a used car salesman. You know, just sow the seed and step away and let them then decide, oh, well, you know what? It, it is the only time I intend getting married. We're gonna have that big party in the spring, but I'm gonna get married today, so, or married this month. So maybe we should do a little bit more. You know, if it's a home, you can sell uh, a wreath for the front door. You can sell decor on the stairs that the bride will come down into the, 
entry foyer or whatever, or steps that she'll come down in the back of the house to come out to her favorite tree in her parents' yard or whatever it may be. So we still have the, the pressure on us to sell, but don't push it too hard. Otherwise, then it looks like you, you're more interested in the money than in the couple. So anyway, uh, let's do another one here for you. I'm gonna just finish this off in person. So this is like a, a vintage um, silver container that I've used a liner in so that it can be lifted out because so many people are interested in taking the flowers home, particularly if it's at a venue. Um, look at how untidy the foliage is here. Uh, again, a lot of these beautiful foliages have come from the Milano company. Um, you know, we've got rosemary and, and so many different things. I used a little bit of fountain grass in the center. There's um, some olive, which grows very well here. I don't know whether it, it may where you are. Um, we've got agonis here, we've got um, salile, I've got a little bit of uh, viburnum from my yard, and a ligustrum too, and so, and then just a, a few ferns. But I could almost get away with this just having some fruit tucked into the bottom, but we are going to add some flowers to it today. Um, let's see what we've got. So yeah, I, I chose to use a hydrangea just to anchor the design right down into the center here, fluff it through the leaves. Um, you can see it maybe a little bit better right here. And then I'm going to add some other beauties at the same time. I have these beautiful um, protea for that boho bride, which we all seem to have a lot of. Uh, this is her kind of style, is this untidy, very unstructured, Okay, so I'm going to tuck just three in because remember it's, you know, these are bigger dollar flowers. So don't sell too many of them in one design and then, you know, you're going to do yourself wrong by underselling. Uh, I've got some heart roses, which are just beautiful just to give us a little bit, you know, with the, the maroon of the foliage here, it's a nice way to add a little touch of blush to, uh, sorry, a little touch of uh, Merlot to this blush color scheme that, that the brides just keep asking for. So I'm adding just a few in here, and then um, I'm going to add a few um, hybrid dolphinium, which it's, we're in between seasons now, so they're not uh, as wonderful as they normally are. So I'm going to add that as a cluster in the center, coming through the, and then I'm going to add some Veronica. This has become a very popular flower uh, in our business. It comes in a few colors and uh, can give you a nice soft kind of line. Look at this, how beautiful and uncontrived it looks. But the placement of your flowers with this style is very, uh, very uncontrived, messy almost, um, and it can be a little bit more peppered. Here's another little heart's rose that we'll maybe, we'll tuck it in right here. And then I've got some spray roses and um, a few ranunculus. Look at how gorgeous these are. So as I, as I continue to design here, um, FTD are, if you, uh, if you go to uh, ftdi.com and go to, um, you'll, if you go there, you'll find a sneak peek of the boot camps that, that we normally do in person. But uh, education specialist Ann Jordan will take us through four weeks of merchandising and purchasing and all sorts of different ideas that, that just make it uh, a little bit more interesting from a business perspective and will allow us to make more money, which is all what it's all about too. So go to ftdi.com and you will find the information there and you'll be able to register there. So here I am just adding my ranunculus in, which it's always, you know, gives you that beautiful gardeny flower. And to me, the, the easiest thing to do is to insert all of one kind of flower first and then you have distributed it through the entire design 
rather than doing this side first and then you go to the back side and you don't have uh, enough product left over to, to take it to the back. So if you do it that way, then you can distribute it through the entire design and it will look perfectly balanced. So here we go. We're just, you know, this might be a piece on a sign-in table. It's certainly too tall for a guest table. You know, a guest table arrangement should be no higher than 16 inches so that someone can still see perfectly well across the table. And it should be no lower if it's a high piece than 30 inches because then even a tall man sitting there can um, see underneath it to talk to the person across the table. So there we go. There's our little messy um, boho design. It's my time is up, I guess. Uh, I'm so grateful to FTD for allowing me to come to you today. I hope that in our quick 30 minutes, I was able to give you some insight into what's going on in our floral world right now and maybe give you, you know, hopefully I've given you some advice on some design. So uh, I think we're gonna go to questions now. If anyone has questions, Janet is gonna ask me those questions and we'll take it for, from there. But thank you so much for being with us today. Please watch Jacob in another few weeks. He has a whole different energetic perspective to the floral industry and I'm sure you can enjoy it more than you even know. So thank you very much. Janet. Ian, thank you so much for inspiring us, sharing a lot of great tips and ideas and, and business uh, tips on uh, how to deal with weddings and events as they are uh, being rescheduled and rescheduled and rescheduled again. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as he mentioned, we are open for questions, everybody. So as a reminder, just type your question in the chat box and we will go from there. Um, we have a lot of comments in here. Um, they love everything. They love learning from you. Um, there's also a question. Can we get the recipe for the last two arrangements that you did? Linda's wondering sure. about that. We can do that. That's okay. not a problem. All right, and I think for those that were on with our uh, program last month with Deborah or weren't, um, if you go on ftdi.com after the fact, we uploaded some close-up pictures of her designs and uh, some of the recipes. So we'll um, plan on doing the same things for uh, Ian's designs this week as well. Uh, lots of great useful tips. Good. Uh, the, the one thing that I will say to you is if, um, if you're using foliage from your garden, please make sure that you condition it properly first. So don't cut it and, and use it immediately. Perhaps cut it the night before, allow it to hydrate overnight, and then use it the following day. So, you know, some of the, some of the, the foliages tend to have little tender spots. And so you might find like, uh, the olive here had a few little tender leaves that you may as well just take those off because they're gonna they're gonna fall overnight or even in a in a few hours. But um, if you're if you're using garden foliage, then then um, go ahead and make sure you condition it properly before you do. So you know, please make sure that your markups are correct. Uh, in event work, the magic rule is five times the cost of the product so if it costs us a dollar it sells for five dollars and so that way you are able to cover a lot of your costs we add 15 percent to 20 percent onto the uh baseline of our the actual cost of the wedding and that is used to uh for setup and for breakdown at midnight you know somebody has to be paid to go there so uh, we, we don't have any pushback on that either. So if you are finding it a little bit difficult to explain, um, then you just add that as a very, you know, a line at the very bottom of your, of your um, estimate that uh, is 15% and it covers delivery, setup, and breakdown. And that way you shouldn't have any more questions about it. So any uh, questions, Miss Janet? 
Uh, yes. I, if, is it possible? Somebody was asking, is it possible that you can hold a piece of the weeping elm closer to the camera? Yeah, sure. I'm curious as to yes. what that looks like. It's just, you know, the a regular elm tree, but it's, it's very sturdy and it gives you these beautiful soft, soft lines. There's a little bit of it, I think, in here also. Yeah, here's some over here. Um, I, I love it and it's in my garden and it's free but I always charge for it. Remember, it's the plant that's in your yard cost you money at some point. So yeah, so this is, this is the, uh, the weeping elm. Beautiful. All right, and then um, somebody is asking, um, oh, well, how do you account for containers in your pricing schedule? How do I count the containers? So let's say it's an arrangement at $250. Um, then I would take 20% off. So that's $50 coming off for the rental of the container and for the foam. So that, that includes the rental of the container and the foam, and then everything else is priced out individually, you know, the foliage, the flowers, you know, whatever. So then that leaves me with $200. So divide that by five means I have $40 wholesale to spend on flowers. So your $40 becomes 200 and then the $50 from the, the container rental and the foam. And that, so that comes to your $250. Perfect. Um, and then we do have another question and I just wanna acknowledge it because I I'm sure you're not going to know. Somebody was just asking about the proteas that you used and if those uh -huh. are carried by FTD Flower Exchange. Um, so I will definitely have um, them reach out to you right. guys about that. Right. This, this, these came from Milano and Company. So um, they have several locations around the country and uh, there'll be more than, it's a Banksia protea. And so that's what you would ask for. Thank you. I knew that name and just couldn't come, come up with that. Um, and just another comment here that they appreciate all the tips on your approach to payments. Um, and they really do like the 15% upcharge for the Saturday weddings. Oh yeah. You've got to cover yourself. You know, it's, I have to bring in more staff to, to accomplish what we need to accomplish for them. And the people were very understanding that it was not, it wasn't a just, we explained it as it was a 15% labor slash staffing fee that covered the cost of bringing more people in to produce and to set up your wedding. No pushback. Awesome. All right, well, it looks like we are out of questions now. All right, well, again, um, thank you FTD for bringing me here today or coming to visit me at my warehouse today. As you can see the shelves of glassware behind me here and uh, props. And uh, it's, it's been a pleasure and I hope to see you next time. Thank you so much. Fantastic. We just want to thank everyone for attending FTD's virtual design show. Uh, if you would like to view it again, a recording will be available on demand on the FTD Mercury Network Florist YouTube channel. Uh, as always, we will be sending you a very brief survey to gather your feedback on today's virtual design show. And just ask you to please take a minute, complete the survey and help us improve future education programs for you. As you can see, Ian's cascade bouquet that he did in the beginning was actually uh, several comments from the last uh, survey that came in. So we, we do read those and, uh, and appreciate your comments and feedback. Um, our next FTD virtual design show, as Ian mentioned, is scheduled for Wednesday, October 14th. It's titled Gathered. Rustic Autumn Inspired Designs by Jacob, and it's presented by FTD Education Consultant, Jacob McCall, AIFD. The registration's already available on ftdi.com. We just wanna thank everyone again for uh, attending today.